thing, then we'll take it from there. All right, gentlemen and ladies, thank you so much for joining us into today's session. USEC stands for UNISA Science Engagement Center. Welcome to the live online learning M2. Um, we have this thing called Facebook. Uh, it's a social media page. We are ISET Lego. And on YouTube, we've been having nice videos there called uh, ISET Junisa. And uh, for those that are joining us for the very first time, you are very much welcome. All questions are allowed. And uh, without wasting time, I'll hand over to Menir Johannes for the basic house rules. Over to you. Thank you so much, Tamela. Welcome, everybody. We only have a few small house rules for today. We would like to ask everybody to please mute your cameras to save data and bandwidth. Also to mute your microphones, keep all the background noise to a minimum. If anybody has a question at any point in time, please feel free to raise your hand or unmute. And we also have a chat area. There will be question and answer sessions be between the presentations. And that's all from my side. Over to you, Dr. Goos. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, so here we are. It's Tuesday. It is Tuesday, yes. Mm. <laughs> and we decided today we'll we'll do some more some demonstration. Oh my word, there you go. Just, there we go. We're gonna do some demonstrations with the robots. Um, because we're doing the color sensor, and so we want to do the ultrasonic sensor as well. Mm. And um I'm going to do it a slightly differently. I'm going to first um, kind of demonstrate what we're doing. Um, we'll demonstrate with the EV3 and the old uh, EV3 lab, and then Sylvia is going to demonstrate exactly the same, but with the um, spike. All right. All right. Okay, so we're trying to, um, wait, let me share my screen. There we go. Sorry, I'm just, okay. So, so what we're going to do is I'm going to first show you, um, we actually got the program to run. So if you've, if you've got the ultrasonic, you can see on the screen there, uh, can we still see on the screen? Can we still see the robot? Yes, we can. Okay, so um, you can see the ultrasonic. Sylvia's just pointing out the ultrasonic there. Um, and it's connected here to point number four. And th so the instruction is, is we've got this loop structure which says we're gonna keep going. Um, um, the, the robot's a bit backwards, so that's why we're gonna go backwards. But it's gonna go until something, um, the distance is bigger than, smaller than, so until the distance is less than 10 centimeters. Now, whatever you put your motor on, you've got to put your motor off as well. So. Oh, Sylvia's no, busy moving the book making so sure. See it. All right. So if we were to run this program, I'm gonna, I'll construct it now for you. And if we run this, download and run, which is not a good, never a good idea, but you I'm should. Not, yeah. Okay. So if you, so it'll go forward until it sees something, and then it will stop. And the distance there, you can see down the bottom there on the port view that you can see what's the view, but um, it's less than ten. So it's less than ten. So as, as long as it's less than ten, then it will stop. All right. So, so just to show you how do you, with ultrasonic, with color sensors, with with touch sensors, you could also have said, um, go forward until, and you could have changed that to say until the touch sensor is bumped. Okay. So that one is released, pressed, or bumped. Okay. And your ultrasonic sensor um, is not connected at the moment. You can maybe no, put it into port number. Touch sensor is port, port number one. All right, so you see immediately as Sylvia put, um, plugs it in, there it shows on your port view. So if we're going to run this program now, I'm going to let it run. And as soon as you just take it back a little bit here. All right, so same program. We're going to download and run. All right, and it's going to keep going until Sylvia touches the touch sensor and then it will stop. All right, so the condition for your loop is always what makes it stop. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's that's a that's the loop with the touch sensor or the color sensor or the ultrasonic sensor or you can put it anyway, or you can even have it here. Okay, yes, let it run. We're going to let it run until 
the color sensor sees maybe say red. Okay, so there's red on the line on the on, you can just uh, turn it that way. Okay, so we're gonna go here. We're gonna go with 30% power. So we're just going forward now. So so there in the front, underneath the bracket, there are your two color sensors. And we're going to go forward until we get to that red line. So here we go. And we're going to run it now. Let's show you. And there we go. It goes forward, 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 forward. It gets to red and it stops. Okay. So two of the things when you have, when you do have color sensor, um, the line must obviously be detectable. If the line is too thin, it's not going to pick it up. All right. And if you're going really fast, you're probably also not going to pick it up. Okay. So, so that is the color sensor. Um, so we just lift up the color yeah. sensor a little. So can you see underneath? Just be a little bit in front. Otherwise yeah. Light. Yeah. Just go down a little bit. There we go. Can you see there's two color sensors? So what we do with two color sensors is we usually do follow the line. Um, either follow the line on the left hand side or follow the line on the right hand side. So if Sylvia just puts the robot, it feels like, okay. So you, if you, we go, I'm going to show you how to follow the line um, on the left hand side, there with a red line, where the red um, little, um, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So it's going to follow the line along the left hand side, there where Sylvia shows. All right. So let me just show you the logic of, of this. And, um, okay. All right. Yeah. So if you if you were to take, and I often tell the kids to take um, a, an empty toilet roll, and then you can understand this program. Let me just make it a little bit. You can kind of do so if you, so that that color sensors on port number two, all right, and that is your reflected light intensity, the R L I value. Thank you. There we go. All right. So Sylvia's got a little circle kind of to demonstrate. If you look in your color sensor, so what's in the circle is what the what the color sensor will detect. If it sees mostly white, that means that it's got to turn towards the road, all right, which means that your C motor so this is the C motor will then go. There we go. All right. C motor goes off and the B motor will then turn. All right. Mm -hmm. If it if the what it sees is less than 50, so it's seeing black. All right. Then the B motor must be switched off and the C motor goes on. So then you are. This is the very fundamentals of line follow. Um, and go, we call it the zigzag. But mm. once your learners understand line follow, um, it's hallelujah. All right. So let's just let's just run this quickly. I'm going to show you how this runs, and then just watch the. It's going to come towards us. There we go. So you can see the red line. It's following. Yeah, there. It's following along the left hand side. Okay, and it'll keep going forever because I've got it forever. So what you can also do, just put it back there where it was, Sylvia, please. All right. So now what we do is we put it on that line, a little bit more forward over that. Inst yeah, there we go. Now what it's now what it's going to do, I'm just going to take this. Um, I'm going to take this start starting block just out. So it just starts following the line. Okay. Now it's going to follow the line, but I don't want it to go on forever. I want it to stop. And I'm going to make it stop when what? When the color sensor that's in port number three okay, C is black. In other words, it's going to go until it comes to that intersection. At that intersection, it's going to stop. And then when it gets there, we're going to turn our two motors off. All right. Okay, so let's have a look. Here we go. We're going to run this program. It's going to follow the line. Follow, 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 follow until it comes to intersection. And then it's going to stop. Okay. So then you can use that. You can use it to count. You can use it to count the number of intersections. So at that intersection, you could make a turn. You could make it go the other way. But but there you already have. You see, like uh, what I said was when you have any sensors that you have on your robot um, makes the environment or the robot a little bit more aware of the environment. Okay. All right, so that was line follow, zigzag, very zigzag, very basic. And then we had, so that's what I showed you. I showed you if you have two color sensors, how you use the one to follow the line and the other one to stop at an intersection. And then I showed you the, the distance sensor with the, with the ultrasonic and I showed you how to use a 
a touch sensor. I would really encourage you to spend a whole lesson with your learners on each of the senses, just to make sure that they actually understand what they're doing. All right, and then you just you just um, every time you just add to their challenge. All right, so this is what I'm going to now stop sharing my screen, and Sylvia is now going to change the tempo totally, and she's going to show you. Um, what the Spike Prime Scratch program is. All right, Sylvia, do you want to share your screen? There we go. At least the robots are behaving. Thank you very much. I'll. I'll... Oh, you don't have to put your phone off. Okay, mine's off. Okay, testing. Can anybody else confirm that you can hear me? Because Patricia can't talk, otherwise it echoes. Yes, we can hear you, uh, Sylvia. Mabel, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hang on, hang on. My sound is off. Whoa. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? <clears throat> can you hear me? Okay, we're we not hearing anything if you are talking. Okay. Uh... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, um, thank you so much for watching our recording. Uh, we are currently facing technical difficulties. Uh, are we admitting her? We're admitting her. I'll just talk in Patricia's computer. Can you share your screen? It'll work, yeah. Yeah, I can share the screen. Two seconds. You just nothing like technology. Yeah, I'm also using a very slow computer, so you're gonna have to. It's yeah, alt tech. Let's see if we can. Oh, we have life. Okay. Um, then we've also got everything on screen. Okay. So you, you want to explain this? Yeah. <laughs> so this is a spike program. Um, if you're using EV3 Classroom, it looks the same and essentially works the same too. Um, you can see here, I've written a very complicated program using all three sensors just to show you how you can possibly use it. So every program will always start at the top of the hamburger bun, as I like to call it, this little rounded piece. Um, and then you always end it with stop and exit all programs, otherwise your program keeps running and then uh, when you try and download something, it won't work. Okay, so you're at the top of a hamburger bun and then you've got your Setting your movement motors. Uh, if you look at my little robot over here, there we go, little robot. Uh, I've got, okay, yeah, the spike also has a different input output style. Uh, instead of having four input ports and four output ports, uh, the spike has six input output ports. So you can plug any, you can plug the motors and sensors into any port but you can only plug six of whatever in. So currently I've got three motors, so I've got the two wheels and the one here on the side, sorry, the two wheels and the one in the middle. I've got a color sensor plugged in. I've got the touch sensor plugged in at the top and I've got the ultrasonic here under my hand. The, mo the sensors are very square and this is a very messy little robot, but anyways. Um, okay, so that's just the difference in sensors. Okay, so what this program is gonna do it's going to wait until I press the color set. Uh, wait until I press the touch sensor. Uh, some some teams like doing this because they've got arms or something that covers the button. Let's do that. Some teams like doing this because they've got arms or something that go over the button, or they've got attachments or something. Um, so they prefer starting all their robots with the touch sensor because then your hands are sort of further away from it and you're not, you know, hands deep in it. Um, and then you've got your, okay, and then it's going to follow the line, which is this little piece here, everything in the if statement. So if the color sensor's light reflected intensity is under 50%, which in this case is black, if it's black, then C will, motor C will be at 10% power and motor uh, D will be at 40% power. This is a little bit of a smoother line follow than the uh, turning one motor off method, which causes it to zigzag heavily. 
Um, but I could just set it to zero percent power and it'll do the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's just if you want a little bit of a smoother line follow that goes faster, <laughs> but you wouldn't want it to end up too far. Um, and then it's going to go forward until you see there it says repeat until the ultrasonic input F is closer than 15 centimeters. Okay, let me just show you a little robot. Yeah, very little <laughs> robot. I'm going to start from all the way back here. Okay, got you. All the way back here, just line that up. Um, and I'm just going to start the program, and it's not going to do anything because it's waiting for the input from the touch sensor. Mm. You can touch that, and then you see, follow the line on the left side until something, which I just moved here, is closer than 15, 15 cents. Yeah. yeah. Which I've got a book <laughs> behind the laptop here, so it's like right It'll there. It'll stop. It is right there, yeah. <laughs> Very basic little program, and then you can see I've got the little uh, hamburger. Screen, the little hamburger button at the bottom, the stop and exit program. Uh, that is very important because if I left it now, the program wouldn't have ended. And so next time I try and download it, it's not going to work. It's just not going to do anything. You're going to be very confused. Um, so yeah, I'll just make it a hamburger bun. Nice rounded one at the top. And the, the one that's flat at the bottom, if I take this piece off, you'll see there's a little... There's a little puzzle piece at the bottom there. We don't like puzzle pieces being in, we don't like puzzles being incomplete. Correct. So then you just fix it by adding it there. Cool. Uh, also, uh, <laughs> just yeah. With the sensors, um, the same as with the EV3, you can see what all the sensor values are here at the top. What's plugged in where as well. Mm. So in this case, uh, the arm motor, I plugged into A because A stands for arm. So my, <laughs> yeah, because you can, you can see it's a big tangle of wires. They're all the same color. It looks very confusing. Uh, not a good yeah. design on a not robot. A, not a very good ah! design at this point, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we, it's a testing robot. We have to be nice to him. Um, but yeah, you can see motors plugged into A there. B is the touch sensor. So you can see if I, it's, it's giving live feedback too because it's connected by Bluetooth. So you see there, it's three in. Now actually, interestingly enough, the touch sensor on a spike prime is actually a force sensor. So it doesn't just have the conditions of, is it pressed, is it not? No, that's just true and false. Uh, this one actually, I think has four levels of pressure. So there's a little bit, a little bit, a little bit more and a little bit more and then five and six and seven. Okay, it seems like there's quite a bit of, yeah, you can quite have... a bit of force there. Yeah. So you can, you can sort of use it to see how, how far you drove into the wall. Um, I don't know, you get quite a few creative ways to use it. Normally touch sensors would be used as bumpers on the side of a robot. So you would attach it to the to the front and then drive into something and then you would have like the ultrasonic on the other side. Okay, I'll put the ultrasonic on this side. So I would put like a bumper on the back with a touch sensor connected to a beam. Mm. And then that would be reversing into the wall so when it hits the wall, there. yeah, yeah, and then you can also make sure that you press really hard backwards, uh, so that you know you uh, you can sort of force align your robot. If you have a robot with a, if you have a robot with a frame, it goes all the way around, and you drive this into a wall at an angle, then it'll straighten itself out, and then you know your robot is straight, mm. ninety degrees perpendicular to the wall. Yeah, and you can drive it up again, and you know you somewhat driving a straight line and not skew. It's also good for al aligning your robot in between robot missions. Yes, it's it's very good for if you uh, like drive. So now you, you actually do want to line up with this line. You could reverse into this wall to make sure that your robot is going to come off that wall straight. So when it drives away, it's completely straight and not it's going to drive at an angle and drive skew. Uh, you can also use the double line Oops, a daisy. You can also use the double color sensors to align yourself with the line. Mm. So if you've got, oops, a daisy. <laughs> that's that. Uh, this is one very cool thing. Is the um, yeah, perfect. Yeah, this is one very cool thing. Is when when you start getting very good at building robots, you build double sided robots um, that confuse the heck out of you when you go to program because <laughs> you don't know which way is forward or backwards because you use both sides to do all the missions. It's like having arms in the 
front of your body and the back of your body and eyes at the back of your body. That's, That's why they're really called good. robots. Yeah. So, yeah, with a double color sensor, uh, you could use it to sort of drive until you see red and then drive the other one until he's red. And that'll make it straight. That'll make it, well, essentially straight. You would yeah. then jiggle it a little bit. There's coding for all of this. It's an official programming term. You would then jiggle it a little bit so that you know you're uh, on one side of the line. Mm. So either you would jiggle off to the front of it or you would jiggle to the back. Normally mm. it's the back. But there are programs to do this. Uh, mm. There are much better examples online than me just explaining it like that. Uh, you can't do it with a single sensor because you can hit the line at an angle. Mm. And then you sort of know you're on red, but you're not in line with anything. That's where you would either, like, you know, like I said, you can use a touch sensor to then turn, drive yourself into the wall, and then go back to red. Then you know you straight. Um, or you would, I mean, you could also use the ultrasonic. The ultrasonic doesn't work very well at an angle, uh, which we've now realized. Um, yeah, the ultrasonic I would rather use uh, a little bit for more solid objects. Uh, so not. So yeah, you would use it for the wall, and you would put the sensor rather low, because the closer you are to, well, not the closer you are to the, the wall, surface. The closer you are to the surface, the sort of better. But also, the wall heights differ in FRL, and we know there's a wall at the bottom of the table, so you just put it a little bit lower than this. The ultrasonic mounted over here is a little bit better. Yeah, you can see this. This level will be okay for finding a wall. This one not so much. Um. Yeah, I was showing you at the top there with the seeing all the measurements. You could also click on the little icon here, and it actually gives you a visual of where everything is plugged in. And then you can also select different inputs. So if you guys are maybe you don't like degrees and you're measuring in rotations, you would come and change this to. Ooh, okay, now you can't change it to rotations. Never mind. Uh, but you can change e which is I think hidden for most of you. You can change E to like say the color instead. So then that'll now show me the color instead. So if I go out, oops, Daisy, I'm looking on two laptops here and it's rather confused. Okay, so now you can see now it's showing, now it's showing 10. Okay, so 10 would be white. If I go over black. Sorry, this, this mat is a little bit reflective. You're gonna have to play with us and check. Now you can see that's showing black, which is color zero. This would be showing either no color or okay, red. So that's if you want to use color instead. You can replace, if you've got a less reflective mat, you can replace this line with this one. It says, is the color sensor, well, is the color sensor on color black? And then that would be your line follow. You can also do it the other way around and if your color sensor is on white. Uh, if you want to follow a red line instead of a black line, then you could also leave this on red. And then if I run this program now, uh, I'm also going to use download and run, which is also not a good idea to use. You either plug in the robot or in the case of Spike Prime, the normal download button is hidden in the little number icon at the bottom here. And then there's just a download there, which you then just press. And again, the spike doesn't make any noises. I don't know why. You're just going to have to believe it's on there. And then click away. And then I can follow the red line instead. And I got lost. OK, yeah. Okay, apologies. This, this mat is a little bit more reflective than usual. so. And that's why I was using the reflected light intensity instead, because you've got more control over what color it sees, essentially. Mm -hmm. Also, I don't think I mounted the color sensor in the correct place. <laughs> um, if you'll notice on the EV3, there we go. Um, Turns around. Well, no, I'm not. If you notice in the EV3, you can see the uh, ultrasonic, you can't see the color sensors. Well, you can't really see anything from there. You can sort of see the light coming from there. Um, with the EV3, the color sensors are currently very covered. 
it's actually a good thing because there's too much ambient other, mm. otherwise it would pick up too much ambient light mm. so all the light in the environment from mm. your desk lamp your laptop uh it could even pick up light from the spikes little uh led on that one yeah so ideally you would build it sort of closed and then also you can't you really can't see it they are very very close if you look how close that is these are lower mm. than that bottom beam and you can see that's nearly touching the mat mm. so those color sensors are very very close to the mat uh, the one on the spike is not because I did not have enough time to build a proper robot. But ideally, this has to be very, very close to the mat to pick up an accurate color. Otherwise, reflected light intensity is better. Don't you have any? Your net screen. Yeah, I know. Just want to check if there are any questions. How does this relate to? Oh, calibration. Okay. Um, Can I calibrate? Show you how to calibrate on. Yeah, EV3. on the EV3, there's a Calibrate. Spike Prime does not have it anymore. Oh. Oh! Because it thinks it's smart. Okay. It, it is fairly smart, <laughs> but sometimes it's a little inaccurate. The, um, the sensors on the EV, uh, on the Spike Prime are a little bit more accurate than the ones on the uh, EV3. Not by much, but enough so that you don't have to calibrate the oh. color sensors. Oh. Okay, no, no. okay, so... <laughs> going all the way back. Patricia can explain how to calibrate it, but the reason you calibrate it is to essentially set what is your brightest color mm. and what is your darkest color. Mm. So in this case, we're working with black and white, but you can see, I mean, you can see there on the wall, we've got light coming in on the side because we closed our blinds. But if we were to open our blinds, there would be more light on this white and mm. this white would look Different. whiter. Mm. Yes, it would be reflecting more light in general. So, yeah. Okay. So can I, can we go yeah. over to EV3 again? Yeah. Okay. So we're just gonna, gonna swap screens again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're busy working with two laptops right now. It's like multitasking here. This is good fun. That's good fun, but I <laughs> tried using your laptop. All right. Times, which isn't so here we go. So if you have on the, on the screen here, and if you look down the bottom here at the color centers, all right, and we are using, in port number two, we are using that color sensor. So just put it onto black, Sylvia. Yeah, that one, yeah. Okay. Put it onto black, and it's on black, and so you'll see the value is seven, all right? So it's not zero as we thought it was. Uh, it's actually seven. Now if, she, now if Sylvia puts um, a port number two onto the white of the surface, all right, now it gives you 82. All right, so then... Um, so you have 82 and 7. You add the two together, you get 89. 89 divided by 2 will give you 44 and a half. All right. Uh, sorry, the cat's in front of the, the screen. Sorry. And so then that 44 is that value there. All right. So that is your threshold value um, that you have. So that'll make a more accurate line follow because you've already calibrated your line sensor. Um, for many years, um, when we did WRO competitions and there was lots of line follow, the afternoon was horrendous. It um, then transpired that there's light coming from under the curtains of the hall. And so this became always a real issue. Just like now through the blinds, you see that, yeah, as Sylvia showed you on the, you can show them. You see, so now that's the blinds light coming in. That does impact on the robot. No, so and, okay, so let's just have a look. What what's the it's the color values now? So now, if you put it on on black, oh, it'll still give you a seven. I don't know white. Well, because it's uh, nice yeah, covered. It is not white. true. True. Yeah. Is it on white, for example? Yeah, it gives you the same okay. values. So it's obviously well it's built. Yeah. No, the robot is well built. <laughs> yeah, the robot's well built. This is like a good ambient light block. Mm. In so general. yeah, in general, if you're not if you've not designed it well, um, the ambient light and especially the the lights from the um, in halls, the fluorescent lights, just yeah. mess with the robots. If you or like I pointed out, you can see there's there's uh, lines on the wall from the blinds as well. If you've got any sort of blind or curtain or obstacle uh, in front of a window, including people standing in front of a window, uh, then they make shadows, and then you get shadows on the board. Yeah. That's um, that's also when you're busy practicing on the floor. Uh, if you've got, if you're using color sensors or light sensors, 
uh, only the two technicians are allowed to be near the board. Everybody else has to stand a good distance away, also to, to, just to keep their shadows off of the board. Mm. That also generally helps. Yeah. That's only if you're using color sensor. If you're not, then yeah. I mean, feel free to go stand right next to the robots. <laughs> That's fine. All right. Okay. If there are no, can I just quickly? I just want to go through the presentation quickly. Are there any questions at this stage? Um, we we had questions on the chat, and then you sort of answered it. So the question was from Elmer says. How does this relate to collaboration? Okay. Yes, a question okay. from yesterday also experienced a problem previously and was told to collaborate. Yeah. And yes. after a few minutes, she said, thanks. That answers my question as I had prime. So not ideal for competitions where you don't know the, what competition yeah. would look like. The, the spike prime in general when you have <laughs> the cat behind the blinds. Uh, we have so many problems with blinds. Um, the thing with the with using the color sensor in competitions, generally you will have to uh, adjust a little bit, mm. but we try to keep the competition tables as well lit as possible mm. so that you like minimize issues. Yeah. If you are having problems with the spike color sensor, um, try playing with it a little bit. Try and see if you can move it a little bit closer to the mat. See if you can uh, enclose it like what we have with the uh, um, Maria. Yeah, with Maria <laughs> with the EV3. Um, block out the ambient light. So build a little structure around this so that there's no outside light coming in. Um, but there are videos online explaining it. Just, I mean, mm. you, you can Google They'll it. They'll find you some nice links yeah. as well. Other, right. Otherwise, you can find the EV3 resources and just modify it a little bit. Um, but yeah, you shouldn't not use it. It is still a very good sensor to use. Mm. Uh, can I'll, save you a lot of time as can, well. Yeah, and the newer the newer FLL mats in particular have a lot of lines leading to a lot of missions. So to completely rule out the color sensor is a bad idea. <laughs> no, no. Just just play with it, test it, have a have a whole lesson dedicated to uh, seeing how accurately you can get it to work, um, and then carry on using it from there. But please don't not use it for competitions just because it's slightly inaccurate. No, no, it, it's it's a good sign if learners can come with a robot that has a color sensor. Yes, okay. it's encouraged. So Sylvia is right here. She's not going anywhere. The robots are not going anywhere. Let's just quickly go through this presentation. Um, I'm going to chair there. Yeah. All right, so, so really with the sensors, it's kind of the next level of robots. Um, we, we do encourage learners yeah. to include sensors on their robot. We do encourage learners to have passive attachments on their robots. Um, it's kind of, it's the next step. All right. Yeah. And we've, we've gone through the cross culture. So, so the whole purpose of sensors is actually to provide input data, um, especially in your input process output system. Um, and there is a whole lot of, we'll do it in, in MOOC number four, is about data logging to make sure that what you captured is actually correct. Your port view will give you a, a good summary of what's currently uh, being read from your environment as well. Okay, so you might have noticed what we're doing now, the robots we've presented now, we've got now multiple sensors. Okay, so it's not just only a color or only a touch sensor. We actually need to use multiple sensors um, so that you have a, a richer input data and it's different values are used to control different um, decisions. All right, so, it's, but especially with color sensors, the purpose of the data measurement determines the type of measurements and the way it's measured. Uh, whether you're looking for a color, you're looking to line follow, you're looking for ambient light. Um, there's some really cool projects with ambient light, and we'll maybe get to that in November when we've got a little bit of time just to just to have lots of fun. Hmm? The Rubik's Cube Solver. And the Rubik's Cube Solver, that's a good one, yeah, as well. Mm. All right, so ab about color sensors, um, we do need to measure, and... So we measure, as Sylvia showed you also, to align to a line, to follow a line, to find a line, to find a color, to find something, something on the on the mat with and all, but the ultrasonic will be before you. Um, but there's also the different light measurements. So the, the one is a, a color, so it'll pick up a particular color, although just be cautious that the color that you're looking for is actually on the palette. Mm. Um, 
I also remember a couple of years ago, we had a challenge with WRO and the green was not green. It was it was not yellow either. It was a kind of in between. And so we needed to have other sensors for that. Um, but, but so that you can have a color sensor. Then what we showed you now with the line follow and the threshold value where you calibrate your color sensor is, is the reflected light intensity that's on the range from zero to 100. Although, as we showed you now today, it was like seven and 82. So it's not quite zero and it's not mm -hmm. quite 100. But, you know, we're getting there. And so then you will get your threshold value then from the calibration. The third light is then the ambient light. And ambient light can obviously increase or decrease. And so that's how you measure ambient light. Well, obviously, your color sense has got to be up and open so that it can measure the ambient light, of course. All right. I showed you about the, the calibration of the sensor really to make sure that your reflected light intensity actually has the correct threshold value. All right. Um, there's a topic called proportional line follow. Um, and it's called the ultimate line follow. I, I would... I would really ask you, though, to ensure that your learners truly understand the zigzag line follow, okay, that they all really understand it, make it, so what I showed you was off and on, um, Sylvia showed a, a kind of a smaller value and a bigger value, you can play around with those values, uh, I can tell you now, though, line follow is not just line follow, line follow for a straight line um, is very different to line follow of a curvy line, and so that is also a lot of learning happening there, um, of course, then there's the best placement for a color sensor. And so there's, they're actually for spike prime. There is a best way of, of actually mounting your spike prime robot color sensors, which, which should help all those who've got spike primes now. Okay, so, so you've got the data coming in from your sensors, but now you've got to use it. All right, so for linear programming, we don't really use um, uh, color sensors or any sensors because it's just this and this and this and this. So we do it one after the other. But for repetition, it's usually the value of a sensor that will then stop the loop, okay, as a as a uh, point of departure to get out of your loop. And then with decisions, the, the value that you're reading will then maybe determine which path of the program is going to be followed um, based on a control value, where your control value is then from your sensors, okay? Mm -hmm. um, it becomes a little bit more technical to have multiple sensors. Then you've got to make sure that your values that you get actually are what you need. Um, and so you, you kind of build these little chunks of, of please do not program everything in one huge, big, massive program and then wonder why the thing doesn't work. Please create code snippets, little pieces of code that are tested and that work. And then and only then do you put the whole lot together. All right. So um, for unit two was about attaching the sensors, obviously according to what they need. So the color center, this is where they, when when you start kind of exploring it, it's just kind of in the front, but it has to be attached rigidly and and has to have the wires, um, the 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 pins and the wires. Um, okay. So that I've told you the color center, the ambient light, which is the natural light, and then the reflected light intensity. <laughs> Oh, no. Spike Prime doesn't have ambient light. Oh, my word. Okay. So, <laughs> you discover everything as you go along. Okay. So, the color center, I always say, you have to um, not put it in the middle because you're kind of, oh, um, you've got to get really onto the purpose. So, mm. so the color center, if you want to make, if you want to follow a line on the left-hand side, you've got to have it closer to your left wheel and then similarly for your right wheel. Um, but it has to be rigid, there has to be connectors, there have to be beams, and it has to be connected to a brain port. Otherwise, the value that you're reading, and you're going to wonder why it's not detecting it, I can guarantee you, send me an email when one of your learners say, ma'am, it's not working. Well, it's not working because there's no wire. Um, please send me that memo. All right. So, um, um, insulation tape, I've got reams of this stuff, of all different colors, as you can put it on different surfaces. Um, a black insulation tape on a white surface, um, find a red line, find a green line, find a blue line. Um, it's a really good tool to, to explore um, color sensors. And then you detect, to, well, you have to be able to detect the color sensor, but the line is too thin. You've got to move very slowly, otherwise you're, otherwise you're going to miss it. And you'll see that if you do data logging, you'll see it just goes too fast. 
Very important for the color sensor, though, is that the shadows. Um, and it's got to be mounted to ensure that you can actually detect what you want to detect, okay? <coughs> and there's a really cool thing when you shine a torch on a robot and then it suddenly stops and so you control it by torch light. It's really cool. Okay. So, um, as I showed you now, you usually have two um, color sensors mounted. Um, and so you can you can follow line left hand side and follow line right hand side two different programs, but it certainly um, helps when you are um, doing competitions where you want to change over mode. And so you have them both programmed. Okay, for those who are still using EV3 lab version, you've got your flow controls at the bottom. And Sylvia showed you the flow controls for the. She'll show you now. She said she'll show you now. Okay. <laughs> Um, so we use the flow controls, then we interpret the sensor data, and then we control the function of the robot. So that's a three, you know, this, that's what we're using it for. And we did show you how you choose your sensors, how you choose your data values. Um, and then really important, um, most important, actually, just put in your um, comments. Please put in your comments. If you put a, If you put a motor on over here, and you come out, you've got to put it off, and you've got to end the program. Um, we're we're trying to install good programming. If this is not a hit and run and a um, <laughs> hit and run and mm -hmm. ad hoc process. Okay. Really try, <laughs> really try the the zigzag. Get the zigzag right. Um, then let them measure the threshold value. Then calculate the average, and then see whether it impacts on the programming. Change the values of the motors, the power settings from from off and on to to say 10 and 20 or 10 and 40 or 10 and 60, and then give them a straight line, then give them a, um, a curvy line and, and then give them a line with a right angle in it. Um, and that does impact whether you follow it on the inside or on the outside, because then- And how fast you're going. And how fast you're going, absolutely, how fast the robot is going. Lots of learning um, and lots of activities here. All right, so that was my follow line left-hand side and, um, I told you how to calibrate your color sensor. Of course, there are great references. There's a whole lot of really cool stuff. Um, the crossing intersections where you can kind of find the intersection and then you move over to the next and then you carry on following the line. There's a really cool video there. Um, and then stopping at the line, which is what we explained to you here as well. All right. Um, the, well, now we don't calibrate, apparently, with Spike Primes. Yeah. Damn, we are missing out on all this really cool stuff. So you can calibrate, and then you put it into a text file. And so now you start teaching learners to, to read values from a text file. And so that becomes just a whole new different way of using data where you can store it into constants and variables. But that is M4, and then we'll, we'll get to that next. All right. So that's, that's for Unit 2. There's a quiz. Um, there's some really cool building activities, ways of attaching your color sensor, um, and then having programming. There's so much, there are so many different programming activities that you can do um, using your color sensor. Um, and really don't, please, I, I know this lesson was more demonstration, which is really important, but I really would encourage you, if you're working with learners with color sensors, um, spend maybe two or three sessions that you really understand, that they understand what they're doing because there's nothing worse than um, a team trying to explain what the color sense is attached for, and then the kids just shrug their shoulders and say, oh, I don't know, oh, I don't know what this is for. Oh, no. no, because the teacher wrote that. No, we don't want teachers writing code, we want the learners to really understand. It's really cool when a 10-year-old can understand how the zigzag program works and, and why you're putting motors on and off. Um, but give, the, give your learners that opportunity. All right. Sure, that was a really... Um, <laughs> Uh, well, a quick presentation. I'm just going to stop sharing. Are there any questions? We've got the robot here still. We're we're happy to answer questions. We've got two robots um, ready and waiting to play. Um, yes. Any questions, Katamela? Uh, yes, we have one from um, Elmery. Yes, Elmery. I'll ask it rather than try and read it off. Um, Long, long ago, when I started with computers and I had a, or oh, with robotics and I had a team, there was an option to program with sound. Is that still applicable or not? Because I know that actually failed horribly when we came to the competition. Yeah, because the noise, the noise sensor, so, <laughs> the yes. sound sensor was a disaster because my class, I don't know about your classes, but my classes were never quiet. 
never. And so to shush a class so that the robot can perform something, it kind of never worked. They they dropped the, the noise sensor for the EV3s. Um, I think they were, were kind of um, just what you call it, um, oh, minimizing or whatever they were trying to do, uh, making it more compact. But but the, the noise sensor was a really cool um, thing to play with for sure. It was cool to play with, but I don't even I don't think it was allowed at competitions, um, or at least uh, I know FLL had a rule against using it because there's absolutely no controlling the ambient sound, um, <laughs> which I think they realized that because they definitely made sure to not give the spike prime one. So there is no sound sensor with the spike prime. Um, and also, interestingly enough, uh, the one sensor we didn't demonstrate today is the gyroscope, oh, yes. the gyro sensor. Um, you don't get it with it with the EV3 kit. It's always a add on um, and it's fairly expensive. So a lot of teams never used it, uh, but if you can use it, the gyroscope works really well sometimes. Yeah, uh, it does fail a lot uh, and we don't usually recommend relying on it too heavily. That's why uh, using multiple sensors is a very good idea. Um, okay, so with the spike, the gyro is inbuilt. Yeah. So if I share my screen again, which okay, I think go I'm going to do, mm -hmm. um, I can show you I think somebody, uh, I don't think anybody noticed because I don't know what the program looks like, but um, there is actually, it always does show the gyro value at the top and it's got three different. Okay, it's coming, it's coming. It's coming, yeah. There right. we go. Okay, yeah, my spike also decided to disconnect. So let's quickly turn back on. And just in case anybody doesn't know that. Oh, um, oh Jeffrey. Both, yeah. oh, my spike's name is Jeffrey. <laughs> Both the spike and the EV3 uh, tend to have a sleep, automatic sleep function. Uh, I think you can set it on the EV3 with a spike. I think it's about 15 to 20 minutes of inactivity and then it turns off. Okay. So don't be surprised if you come back and your robot's off. Uh, but there we go. We're connected and back to project. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. You can't see it here at the top values. You're going to have to go into live sensor mode and then here we go. These three here, your pitch and roll, three very nice names. So your is turning on a 2D surface. So imagine the robot's driving on a protractor. So whatever the robot started in now was zero, and now I am turning it flat in a circle. <laughs> and then uh, I forgot which way is pitch. I'll, I'll show you now. There's a little uh, demonstration in the program of which way is which. <laughs> Um, but then you've got pitch and roll. So one of them is forward. That would be pitch. So towards the, the top and the bottom of the brick, towards the charging port, port or the speaker, that would be pitch. And then towards the side ports is roll. So I'm changing the pitch as well because I can't. There we go, roll. Okay. Uh, I actually wrote myself a very cool little program. Uh, which was running in the background, which nobody saw. Yeah. If you look here at the top, uh, this program stops the robot uh, if it tilts too much, aka when you pick it up, it automatically stops the robot. Uh, I'll demonstrate it in a second, but let me just quickly show you the, the, the built in gyroscope, how to check what you're working with, because it does show you. Does show you what you're working with. I don't know if it wants to pick it up now. No, it doesn't want to show. Uh, hang on. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, it's the, the tilted sensor, sorry. Then it shows you here which which way it's tilting. You can also specifically make a tilt. Uh, if it specifically tilts to the right or specifically tilts to the left, if it tilts forward or if it tilts backwards. Uh, this is a very smart robot, so you can use it for a lot. Um, like I said, this little program here at the top. Oh, it's also, <laughs> you can also say if the robot is shaken, which is a rather funny one. So if, yeah, if you shake the robot or tap it, or if it falls, because it's got an accelerometer in it too. The brain has got an accelerometer on it. Let me, let me emphasize that. This is the brain itself. Not the motors, not any mm -hmm. other sensors. These 
sensors of the accelerometer and the gyroscope are built into the brain, into the hub. There we go. Um, so yeah, you can also if uh, like. So now you don't want your robot to go very far, but uh, you can't grab it in time, so you can just tap it. You can do that. If your robot is falling, you can also make it stop, or um, I would say you could make it scream, but the Spike Prime doesn't have proper speakers. Mm -hmm. The sound plays from your laptop, and the little brain can only, the little hub can only beep at you. Yeah. Okay, but let me, let me just quickly demonstrate this program here at the top of um, the... The, if the robot is not, ooh, yeah, I'm not explaining. It's, it's logic, yeah, it's logic. Uh, it's basically just going to stop the program when I pick it up, stop the wheels. I'm just gonna lean in the background the entire time. <laughs> if it... mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sylvia, your robot is just a little bit off screen. I know, I know. Yeah, we're trying to get it to move. <laughs> there we go. Since my Bluetooth connection is running. Okay, let me just run it from the program. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah, my pro my program only starts when you touch the touch sensor. Okay, so that's moving. So you at the line and then you just pick it up and it stops. It stops. Pretty simple. Very touch sensor. Touch sensor and then just I made it so that when you, you, you saw now I grab the robot very, very much from the front, but this works if you grab your robot from the wheels as well and they stop moving so that you're not holding the wheel still. I don't know, I just like it. It's also for if you run over objects, run into obstacles and stuff and it tilts, it'll also stop. So one of the, so if you have an EV3, there's a 91, we always have, call it the 911 button. It's that on the, on, oh, the yeah. on the brain. Okay, well, let's sh let's show you on both. This is just good practice. Okay, so when you're carrying a robot, two hands, always. Doesn't matter where you grab it, always just two hands. If you pick it up by the brain or by one part, you can very easily pull it off, which you don't like, which we don't want to do. Um, particularly with the Riley Rover, uh, the brain is not attached very, very well. So with the Riley, which is the test robot that most people use, uh, if you grab it just from the top, the brain comes off and you drop the motors mm. on the ground. Or if you, even worse, if you pick it up by the sides, um, sometimes you tend to pull the tires off and then you drop the whole robot. Not advised. Okay, this, this applies to every... Excuse me, I'll start the program again. Okay, <laughs> now. Applies to every robot. You grab it by the sides or uh, you, you get better at knowing where to grab your robot, depending on its shape, because sometimes you can hold it to demonstrate things, but kids, always two hands. Yeah. Always. Um, okay, yeah. Emergency button. So if your robot is running and you want it to stop, this little button right here in the corner. Yeah. That's right. the 911 right button. Right there. You can actually write 911 on it with permanent well, marker. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would suggest that the quickest way to teach your kids anything, and I would recommend you run drills with this, is you just let them make a program that just drives forward, just forever, or just for like 20 seconds or so. Let it drive forward and let them practice. Either you stop the robot and then pick it up, or if it's uh, really that bad, if you can somewhat try and pick up the robot Sometimes. in a way that you can stop it at the same time. Yeah. But mostly you would stop and then pick up mm. immediately. Um, and also that's, that's why you don't use the download and run button, because if you're walking with the robot from one place to the other and somebody presses download and run, you could be holding the robot. Okay, this is a, again, this is a very good design. You can't touch the wheels. But if this robot would just start running and I'm holding it, um, I might lose grip of this. Yeah. So then I would immediately want to stop it. With a spike, just want to unplug that quickly. With a spike, you only have two buttons, a Bluetooth connection button, and then this button is a catch-all. Mm. So to start the program, you press it. Uh, in this case, it stops the program because mm -hmm. the robot's tilted. <laughs> if we're on any other, okay, I think all my programs have this little, uh, Tilt thing on it just because I like it very much. Let's run that one. Okay, so if it's running, yeah. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. Well, no, <laughs> there's something there, but something's wrong with it that it doesn't want to go. Okay. Um, but anyways, if you're running a program and you want it to stop, it would be the center button Okay. to stop it again. Uh, the spike's a little bit more difficult to stop, which is why I wrote myself this whole program that when you just catch it, 
Yeah, you can you can see it's it doesn't show anything when the program is running, and then the little number pops back up when it stops. Yeah, it, the screen is hard to difficult to interpret. Uh, but yeah, uh, I would I would suggest the gyro with the spike uh, is useful for. Everything else, I don't think the turning is too accurate. So the your, how you would use the gyro with the EV3 if you yeah. get into any of those lessons. <laughs> but it is useful. Yeah. And it's the very fun. is the next level. At, yeah, sort of. Yeah. With the, with the spike, everything's uh, very accessible. A lot more accessible than the EV3. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Any other, I don't see that anybody's hands up. I think you've all... We've had a really good session. We've had a good session at three o'clock and we've had a great session at four o'clock. Um, if there are any questions, you're welcome to uh, email us. Um, any questions, um, we're happy to answer. If you've got any questions about the how to program with the spike, if uh, if you're switching from one to another, mm -hmm. uh, anything like that, just email somebody at ISET and they will forward it to, they'll either answer it or they'll forward it to me and I'll try and help you. There we go. And our uh, YouTube channel is also, the link is also in the chat area. Yes, I also thanks, saw awesome. what, uh, okay, I did see in one stage Jan Miller was trying to unmute and to, uh, ask a question, but I'm seeing he's typing at the moment. Okay, okay. Okay, he says he will follow the rest online. Okay, okay, excellent. All right, so it's been a stunning session. Thank you everybody for your participation. Um, it's been good. We'll see each other then tomorrow again, three o'clock for Tomello's Environmental Science and uh, Robotics and Environmental Sciences. And then four o'clock, we are going to do some power detachments. All right. Have a good evening. Have a tremendous Tuesday and we will see each other on wonderful Wednesday. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Casper. Thanks, Tomello. Bye.